So the second problem we have for today is on Glossin model. In particular, I asked you to solve exercise one. Uh, this was chapter six. I also gave you a couple of uh, just general questions, not tied to any particular problem in the book. We'll look at the first one of them on Wednesday and uh, we'll look at the second one very quickly at the end of today, likely. So just like we did with Kyle's model, let us, before diving into the problem, quickly refresh what uh, Glossin's model was all about. Now, it was effectively a very, very similar model to, to Kyle's model. So you can think that we had one market, no, sorry, one um, informed trader, probably an uninformed trader. And instead of the dealer, we now have a limit trader, a trader who submits limit orders. The difference between the dealer and the limit trader is that the limit, sorry, the dealer could observe the whole trade size queue and offer a price that was conditional on this whole trade size queue. For a limit trader, things are different. So I was, I was and will be jumping a little bit between the interpretations of one competitive limit trader and uh, many, many, many competitive limit traders who all submit one order. Let me now take the second interpretation. Say that there are many, many limit orders who all submit limit orders for one unit. So what can this limit trader condition upon? What, what is the information that he has from uh, his trade being execu exec executed from this event? This limit trader does not know the total trade size queue. He cannot look into the future, just a couple of seconds, and see how many more traders in the limit order book will be executed against this market order. So the only thing that this limit trader knows is that his order is executed. So he knows that the total order size was at least Q. Right. Here, Q is this limit trader's position inside the limit order book. So basically, if uh, we look at the formulas, we have this. In Kyle's model, the price that the dealer would have set for all units of an asset for an order of size Q would be given by this conditional expectation, the latter one. The expected value of V conditional on the order size being Q. And here conditioning is in slightly different terms. Uh, so I do hope you remember them from Wednesday. While here in the Glossons model, our trader, the, the marginal price for the Qth item will be given by the conditional sorry, by the expected value of fundamental conditional on the trade size being larger than Q. So that's an important difference between dealer markets and order driven markets. In these limit order book markets, the price will be discriminatory. So the market trader, the trader who submitted the market order, will execute different parts of his market order at different prices as he climbs up the book. So this was the main difference. This was the main idea that we had on Wednesday. And there was also one example that we did not go through on Wednesday that I think would be instructive to look at. And let me see if I remember slide number. Yes. So this is the slide deck from Wednesday, by the way. I have not told that. So this is example two. Here, in this example, we are taking a very, very um, aggregate approach. We are not looking at the micro level 
we are not looking at the behavior of the traders. We are not uh, saying that it's optimal. So here we are assuming that we have some distribution of trade size Q, just total in the market, not just from informed or uninformed traders. So we are assuming that this order size Q is uh, has a exponential distribution, symmetric around zero. And we are assuming that the informed traders, the speculators, are behaving in such a way as to generate a linear price impact equation. So that the fair value of the asset, the, uh, the market valuation of the asset conditional on some given order size is given by an expression that is linear in this order size. So in particular, this behavior will not depend in, in the rest of this example on the strategy of the limit traders. We are just, this time it's a pure assumption, just for simplicity. And we are trying to figure out how will limit traders behave in this environment. So going back to the blackboard. Uh, example two from lecture six. We will know that the marginal price for Qth, or maybe we can write it like this, Qth unit of the asset is given by, in our notation, it's, this was P prime of Q. So recall that large P of Q was the total cost of executing an order size Q. So P prime was the marginal price for this Qth unit, for the last unit traded. And as we have just discussed, this will be given by the expected value of V conditional on trade size Q being uh, larger than uh, Q. So the, how do we, how do we write it? Um, Let me write it in a very stupid way. Trade size greater than this Q. So what we know from the assumption that the expected value of V conditional on trade size being exactly equal to some Q is given by a linear price impact equation. So it's mu plus uh, lambda times Q. So in order to get this equation, this marginal price of the Qth unit, what we can do is we can take this price impact equation and we can take expectations of both sides of it, conditional on this event. So I will not write this, or I guess I can write this. We'll have um, the expectation of this expectation, of the old conditional expectation, but now it is conditioned on the trade size being larger than Q. And this is equal to conditional expectation of mu plus lambda Q, conditional on the same thing. So what we do here is we will use the law of iterated expectations once again, this dark magic, for the upper nested expectations. And we will have, uh, what we will have, what will happen is that this inside expectation, this inside conditioning will just get destroyed. So we'll have expectation of V conditional on trade size being larger than Q. This is what we'll have left on the left hand side of this expression. And on the right hand side, uh, we know that mu is a constant and lambda is a constant, so we can take them out of the expectation. 
So we'll have expected value of Q conditional on trade size being larger than Q. I've, I, I have written this in the wrong way. So this mu plus lambda Q should be uh, trade size. It should not be the marginal unit, this should be the total trade size. So it's our, yeah, our ex expectation of V conditional on trade size being Q. Well, I, I guess here it is equal to Q because our trade size is actually equal to Q, right? But in this inside expectation, we'll need to go back and realize that this Q was not our marginal unit, but it, this was the total trade size. So we do this, and we'll also have the trade size here. If in your notes you denote trade size by some letter, like X or Y, this will look a lot nicer. So, why, do we, why did we do all this? We did all this because we wanted to find the expected value, the fundamental value of the asset conditional on trade size being above some Q. And we have obtained this expression. So how do we find this expectation? How do we find conditional expectation of trade size uh, given that it's bounded below by some Q? Well, we do it like we do with all conditional expectations. We can take the integral of trade size with respect to conditional density of trade sizes, conditional on them being larger than Q. So let me now go back to the slides. Here it is. So here we derive this conditional expectation, conditional, sorry, probability density of the order size distribution. And to add to the confusion here, Q is the total order size and YK is um, the, the limit trader's position in the Q. So in terms of what I just had on my whiteboard, beige board, uh, Q is the trade size and YK was denoted as Q. Sorry about that. So how do we find this conditional expectation? Now this conditioning is a simple truncation. So we will have uh, just the old unconditional density scaled by the total probability of uh, our order size being larger than YK. And this will be the conditional density for all Qs larger than 1K, YK and this conditional density for Q smaller than YK will be zero. Now we can write this probability as an integral, just by definition of probability. This is the sum of probabilities of all Qs happening between YK and infinity. And now if we plug in the actual distribution function that we assumed for F of Q, for Q, we assume that it was exponential. This was the CDF. And here we are focusing on ask side. So we are assuming that YK is positive and therefore Q is positive. So we can get rid of the expected value at Q. And if you compute the integral in the denominator, you will get this expression. So then with some work you can get we can arrive to one of these two expressions for the conditional density. So now let us plug this conditional density back into the conditional expectation of Q, conditional Q, the trade size being greater than some level YK. <coughs> so the first line is what we had before. And now let us explicitly write this 
conditional expectation on the right hand side as an integral as I said this is an this is a sum of all values of Q above YK or an integral in continuous case so the sum of all possible values that Q can take times the respective probability that Q takes this actual value and this probability vaguely speaking is given by our conditional density that we just found so plugging this conditional density in there we will have well this we already took one term out of the integral because it's a constant it does not depend on Q and what we have left inside the integral is um, Q times theta, the constant that we did not take out, times the exponent to the power of minus theta Q. Now, this is not a super easy integral to take. You cannot just brute force it. You, can, you have to use hacks. And the dark magic that we are using in this particular case is called integration by parts. I'm sure you've all seen it in school. Most of you have probably forgotten about it since then. Now is a good time to refresh what integration by parts mean. I will not go through the motions, as I almost never do. But if you do, if you go through the motions, you will get that this integral, tough integral that we have here, is equal to this expression. And so if you work on it a little bit, you will eventually arrive to this. So conditional expectation of the fundamental value of V conditional on Q being above some fixed level YK is given by mu plus lambda times 1 over theta plus YK. Now obviously this is larger than the expected value of V conditional on Q being equal to YK, conditional on some fixed order size which would be just equal to mu plus lambda q, mu plus lambda yk. So now we have this 1 over theta here. And this is to remind you that conditional on some qth unit of the asset being traded, the expected value of the asset as perceived by limit traders is higher than uh, by the dealer who faces the order of size Q. So now, what did we actually do? So we found the expected value of V. Oh, right. Yeah, our model is a little richer, the model that we had in class, uh, than the Kyle's model. So we are not just saying that the price, AK, AK was our notation for tick, so for some grid point at which price can be set. We're not just saying that uh, this price should be equal to the conditional expectation of V, because we also had display costs C that the limit trader had to pay in order to submit an order and this cost was incurred independently of whether the order was executed. So the total expected profit of the limit trader is given by the probability of trade times the profit from trade. Again, the price minus the expected value, since we're focusing on the ask side, minus the display cost, which is independent of the trade. We are still assuming that dealers are, that, uh, sorry, limit traders are competitive, meaning that this expected profit should be equal to zero. So once we plug in everything we know about the distribution of Q and the distribution of V conditional on trade size Q, we will get this nice expression that connects. Excuse me, that connects price AK of the YK unit uh, and, well, the, the depth of the market YK. 
So this YK is the cumulative depth of the market up to price AK. So this is how much you can buy with a market order if you're willing to pay, to pay any price up to YK. Now, just to remind you, in what we're doing, we assumed that tick, ticks AK are fixed exogenously. And what we were hoping to find was YK. We were hoping to find this cumulative depth condition on prices. So this, uh, even though this equation is framed in terms of AK equals something, Really, you have to solve it for yk, which is once again not a trivial task because you have yk entering linearly and yk in an exponent, but you can solve it numerically for sure. So this was the example from an equilibrium, from lecture. This one example of how Glossen model can work with discrete ticks and display costs. And now let us get back to the problem at hand. So this problem effectively continues this example that we just had. The difference is that now we no longer assume traders behavior, but now we are trying to also optimize from traders point of view. We are asking how would informed traders behave? Uh, optimally, given the limit trader's behavior. So we are moving from the partial equilibrium picture to a more general equilibrium. So let us assume that uh, security value V is distributed uh, still exponentially. So it's pretty much the same distribution. Uh, now we have parameter uh, called sigma, which was theta in what we just did. And so moving on to traders. We'll adopt the same di dichotomy that we have in gloston milgram model and in uh, Kyle model. So we'll assume that some traders are informed, some traders are uninformed. So their informed traders arrive with probability pi or with probability pi market order comes from informed uh, trader. And these informed traders they know V perfectly, and as usual, they just maximize their expected utility. So they are choosing their order size optimally. With probability 1 minus pi, the trader is uninformed, again as usual. And in this case, the trader buys or sells, so submits a buy order or a sell order with equal probabilities. And the trade size of the uninformed traders is also distributed exponentially. Yeah, sorry, in, in the example that we just did, we had a distribution of order size and not the value. So value was stemming from uh, distribution of trade sizes and linear price impact equation. But in the end, the distribution of uh, value V that we had in that example would be exponential. Okay, so the uninformed trader's order size is exponential. Again, just like we had in the example. And what we're assuming now is that the tick size is uh, nil, meaning that price can be anything. Limit traders can submit and limit order at any price they want. So we will assume that the limit order book is continuous, but more on that in a second. One hint that is given in the textbook for this problem is that uh, this conditional expectation that we have just derived for the uh, exponential distribution, expected value of V in this particular case, conditional on it being above some fixed level of uh, fixed level z is just given by z plus the unconditional expectation uh, of v or conditional on sign. And this is given by the distribution parameter sigma. Okay, so this is the problem setup. Again, the difference from the example that we just did is in uh, 
not assuming anything about the informed trader's behavior, but instead trying to derive it. So let us try to derive it. Sorry. Here we go. Here we let y of a to be the cumulative depth up to ask price a in the book. And a star denotes the lowest ask price in the limit order book. So what we want to show is when the value is above this minimal price, meaning that there are some gains from trade, from buying the asset for the informed traders. The optimal strategy of the informed trader is to buy Y of V shares. Now, this problem may or may not sound confusing. The easiest way to look at it is geometric. So let us go back to our drawing whiteboard. Start a new one. So if we just draw a here. If we draw the supply curve generated by the ask side of the limit order book. So we'll have something like this. The supply curve by itself is trivial, but I want to focus on the axis. So what we did in class, the way we usually see it, is there is some quantity, trade size Q, and this will be the marginal price P prime of Q. And here, I, th this will not, I guess, be the standard supply curve, because conditional on total trade size being some Q, no, sorry, let us call this Y. The dealer, sorry, the market trader will pay this much for the first unit, this much for second unit, this much for third unit, and so on. So he will climb up this curve and he will not pay this final market price for all units Y that he bought, but rather he'll pay discriminatory price for every unit. So that's the thing to remember with this supply curve. Okay, that's how we did it in lecture. What we are being said now by the problem is we should see this supply curve in the opposite coordinates. So it's saying us that there is some price A, let me denote it in a different color. So this is price A. And we will de denote the other coordinate by the Y of A. So Y of A is the cumulative depth of the market at price A. That's how much you can buy up to price A. So Y of A is just basically the other way of seeing the, uh, the supply curve. <coughs> And now, so we also said that this lower intercept of the supply curve is some A star. Oh, the star is horrible. Star. Okay, let's call it a star. And we're saying that the fundamental value V is somewhere above this A star. And we are asked to show that it's optimal for the informed trader to submit order size of y of v. So exactly up until this uh, supply curve intersects v. Now, I'm sure you already five minutes since understood how it works, how to show it, but just to give you geometric intuition, what, um, yeah, let's see this speculator's decision, trading decision as sequential. So let's say what is the tra uh, informed trader's trade-off when he decides whether to buy the first unit of the asset. The marginal cost of doing so is given by the marginal price of that unit and that's given by the supply curve. 
the marginal benefit from buying that unit is given by V. This is the profit, or I guess the total revenue, you can call it, that the trader gets from buying the unit. What is, what is the trade-off for the second unit? The marginal revenue is still given by V, the marginal cost is given by the supply curve. So this, therefore, implies that the trader will continue as long as the marginal cost, the supply curve, is below V. So our speculator will buy the unit as long as marginal price is below marginal uh, revenue from buying the asset. So he will buy up to Y of V because this is exactly the quantity at which uh, the marginal price of the next unit is exactly V. So this is it. Let us go back to <clears throat> the slide. The slide does the very same thing, but in words instead of a graph. And this might be a little more confusing. So I will not go through this because we have just seen the graph. Let us move on instead. Part B asks us to, sh to derive basically the uh, supply curve, to derive the limit order book. And we should do this using part A and the zero profit condition. Well, and presumably the distribution properties that we have obtained. But let us follow the slides on this one. How do we do it? From part A, we know that the informed traders trading strategy, let's call it Q star of V. So Q star of V, oh, here it is, is how much the speculator will trade conditional on V. And what we know, what we have just derived, is that the marginal price for the last unit that the speculator will be willing to trade is given by exactly V. So this is the equality that we have just derived. Again, in another notation. Not in terms of the uh, Y of A, but in terms of P prime of Q. <clears throat> On the other hand, the zero profit condition that we can also use looks in this problem where we do not have any display costs. Looks as follows. So here, the marginal price of the Qth unit should just be equal to the expected value of the fundamental valuation V, conditional on the total trade size, Q star of V, being greater than Q. Or, I guess this is a little imprecise, because the limit trader does not know whether the order came from informed trader or the uninformed trader. So here Q star is meant to say the market order size. If it comes from informed trader, it will depend on V. If it uh, came from noise trader, it's just random. So this is exactly what is written in this next expression. If we expand this conditional expectation of V conditional on total trade size in the market being greater than some level Q, we get that if the order came from the informed trader, and we will denote that uh, by probability by alpha Q, we'll get to it in a second. So if the order came from informed trader, we are taking expected value of V conditional on V being above this marginal price, just from the strategy that we have just obtained. And with a complementary probability, the market order came from an uninformed trader, and in that case we get no new information about V, so it's just the unconditional expectation. The conditional expectation equals the unconditional expectation. So what is this alpha of Q? What is the probability of seeing, what is the probability, sorry, of the market order of size at least Q coming from an informed trader? 
we can use Bayes rule to derive it. So the conditional probability of trader being informed, conditional on the trade size being at least Q, is equal to the unconditional probability of trader being informed times the informed trade the probability of the informed trader submitting a buy order size of at least Q divided by the unconditional probability of the facing a market order of size at least Q, which is equal to this uh, numerator plus similar probability for the uninformed traders. So we plug in the probabilities, probability of trader being informed is pi, probability of buy order uh, size being at least Q is equal to the probability of V being above the marginal price for the Qth asset. And in the denominator we have this, same thing, plus the probability of trader being uninformed times the probability of the uninformed trader size being above Q. So let's compute the two components that we have left in alpha of Q. The conditional probability of the value being above some uh, marginal, being above some level, some P prime of Q, is given by the sum, <coughs> excuse me, of probabilities of densities of V for all Vs above P prime of Q. So from, from P prime Q to infinity, if you plug in the G, the exponential, you'll obtain this expression. Uh, for the second term, we also need to find the probability of the uninformed trader, uh, of the uninformed trader's order size being above Q. We do it in the very same way. So it's the integral of f of x for all values of x from Q to infinity. If you plug in f, you obtain this expression. So we plug these probabilities back into our expression for alpha q. Going back, here it is. And also this. So we plug these probabilities in here. And we obtain this expression. Just with a lot of exponentials. If we simplify it a little bit, so we multiply numerator and denominator by uh, exponent to the power theta q, we divide, again, both numerator and denominator by pi, we can get to this expression. <clears throat> so this is our alpha of q. This is the probability that trader, limit trader, assigns to facing the informed market trader, conditional on the qth unit of the asset being sold, on the limit order for the qth unit uh, being executed. So recall that we needed this alpha in order to compute the conditional expectation of the fundamental value v, uh, conditional on the trade size being at least q. So let us go back to that. This is the expression that we had. We know what alpha is. We know from the hint and from our computations in example two how to compute this conditional expectation of V. Conditional on V being above some level. And we know that the unconditional expectation of V is just mu. This is the notation that we use. So plug in all of, all of things that we have in this expression and doing some algebra, you will arrive to this expression. This is not nice. Let me circle it like this. So this time around I'm omitting the algebra. Uh, but I believe you can go through on your own. And from this expression, if we take logs of both sides, it can be transformed into the expression here. So if you still remember what we were asked to do in the very beginning, we were asked to derive 
the, the supply curve of the asset. We were asked to derive y of a, so cumulative depth of the market given some price a, and this is it. We just need to change the notation a little bit. In particular, our order size q is the y of a that we are looking for, cumulative depth of the market up, up to price a, and price a is the marginal price of the qth unit. So substituting q by y of a, substituting p prime q's by a's, we will get to the result, which is this one. So this is the expression that we were asked to show, that y of a uh, looks like this. So this was a little long, a little difficult, but again, nothing really beyond a lot of algebra. The very basics is uh, the very same of what we did for many weeks up to this point. We have informed traders trading strategy. We have a zero profit condition. We combine them together. We invoke some forbidden magic. And voila, we have our price impact coefficient, price impact equation. Or in this case, the limit order book supply curve. So this was part B. Moving on to part C. We are asked to show that the book becomes thinner, again just focusing on the ask side, when either pi increases or sigma increases. Meaning that when there are more informed traders or when the volatility of the underlying fundamental value increases. So the sigma was parameter in the distribution of phi. So how do we do it? What does it mean for book become thinner? For the book to become thinner? It means that the cumulative depth y of a for any given price a becomes lower. Right? Book thinner, same as depth, lower. So we take our expression for the this cumulative market depth that we have just derived. And we simply take a derivative of this expression with respect to first pi. So pi will only be, oh no, not here. Pi only enters in this fraction. And if you take the derivative, you will arrive to this expression. And you can see that 1 over theta is positive, pi times 1 minus pi is positive, because pi is between 0 and 1. And we have a minus here, meaning that the whole term, that the whole expression is negative, meaning that uh, the book does indeed become thinner, on the ask side at least, when there is more informed trading. So the math is easy, the intuition is also the very same intuition that we've had for many, many models before now. The more informed trading there is, the more the, the costlier it is for the dealer to trade. And in this case, dealer is uh, limit traders. So limit traders are less eager to submit their limit orders meaning that liquidity in the market dries out. In this case, depth in the market also dries out. So moving on to the second one. We also want to show that the book becomes thinner when sigma increases, the volatility of V. So we once again take this expression for cumulative depth Y of A, and we take its derivative with respect to sigma. Here is just a little bit more difficult because we have sigmas in two terms. Not really that much difficult. But if you take the derivative, you will arrive to this expression, which is also negative. So what's the intuition for this? 
more volatile V would mean that in a sense adverse selection is stronger. So recall that the expected value of V conditional on V being above some value is what we are looking for. And the higher is sigma, the higher is this conditional expectation. So conditional on V being above some fixed level, we know that on average things are getting worse. In a sense, higher uncertainty um, about V is uh, partly the same thing as uh, more informed trading. Or we can see that at least in this particular case it has the same effect. Okay, so this is all there is for problem 6. And the last thing we have for today, just for the very few minutes that we have left, is that small question that we had. And this open-ended general question was, if you could choose between trading at discriminatory prices in a limit order book, or to trade with a dealer and reveal your order size to a dealer, what would influence your choice between the two? So basically, if you are an informed trader and you face a choice between going to a limit order book market or to a dealer market, how can you choose? Again, the main difference between the two is how prices are formed. You reveal your whole order size to the dealer and you get a single price for that whole order. While in the limit order book, you basically climb the limit order book, receiving a separate price for every single unit of the asset that you are trading. We know that for the last units you trade, the price will definitely be worse than the dealer would quote for those well, last units if you uh, told them they would be the last. This comes exactly from uh, from the observation that we started this half of the lecture with. That the dealer conditions on to total tra trade size, limit order, limit traders condition on order size being above the level. So the price you get is worse for the last units you trade. The price may or may not be better for the first units you trade. And this depends on how large your order is. So if you are trading a very large order, let's go back to this slide, you are losing a little bit on the last units you trade, but you might be winning a lot on the first units you trade. While if your order is small, then you are losing on the last units you trade, but basically your order size is very small, so you are losing on all units you trade compared to a dealer market. So the rule of thumb is you want to trade small orders against the dealer because this will allow you to credibly convey that you do not have much, you do not have a very strong information about the underlying fundamental value. Well, you cannot signal that to a limit order book market. While for very large orders, this is the opposite. This goes the, the other way around with the dealer if you say to the dealer that i want to huge this i want to trade this huge amount huge number of stocks the dealer will realize that you probably have some very strong reasons to do so meaning you know that v is very very different from the uh, from what the market expects from what the dealer expected so the dealer will give you a pretty unfavorable price for that large order while in an order-driven market, in a limit order book, you can exploit the limited information that limit traders have, that limit traders can condition their prices on. And so the average price that you will get for your large order will probably be 
better than what the dealer would have offered you. Now there is a secondary, relatively minor, I would say, concern, but concern nonetheless is if in the limit order book you have ticks, you have some fixed price levels, so not any price can be set, but only some uh, fixed ticks. What we said in the lecture on Wednesday was that the larger is the tick size, the larger is the profit of the limit traders. Which means that this profit actually comes at your expense, your expense as a market trader. So if tick sizes are very large, then limit traders will um, extract a lot of profit from you. So submitting to a limit or a book market becomes relatively less appealing if tick size is large as compared to a dealer market where the dealer can quote any price he wants.